There are, there are many in the church who believe that there is no way for us to have any kind of awareness of when Jesus is going to come back. They just kind of go through life and they go, you know what, all these events are happening and it's not a big deal and it's just that's been happening from the beginning of time and, you know, that it really doesn't affect anything. And they actually begin to mock you if you actually have an expectation for Jesus to come back. They begin to think, you know, you're one of those. You're one of those, you know, crazies. You're one of those Jesus freaks, right? They're, you're a hallelujah, right? They, they kind of start to think that you, you lost touch with reality because you believe that one day Jesus is coming back for his church and for his bride. And it's exactly what we're told in Scripture would be the, the temperature or the atmosphere in the world when Jesus comes back. So when they tell you those things, they're actually, they're actually affirming what Scripture says. Turn to me real quick, 2 Peter chapter 3. Check this out. This blows my mind. Chapter, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 1. Beloved, I now write to you this second epistle, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of reminder that you may be mindful of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and the commandments of us, the apostles of the Lord and Savior, knowing this first, that scoffers will come in the last days and they'll be walking according to their own lust. And they're going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. For this they willfully forget, that by the word of God, the heavens were of old and the earth, standing out of water and in water, by which the world then that existed perished, being flooded with water. Now, here, here's, here's the, the, the picture that Peter gives us. He says, look. In the last days, what's going to happen is everyone's going to think that, you know, because it didn't happen in the last generation or the generation prior to that or the generation prior to that, that it's not going to happen. And so there's this kind of like, you know, they've been saying that forever. You know, my grandma used to say that. My great grandma used to say that. My great, great Theo used to say that. I mean, everyone said that and it hasn't happened yet. So it's not going to happen. And he says, in those days, there's going to be scoffers. They're going to be mocking those who actually believe these things. And, it, and, it's, and it's what's happening today. But he says, one thing they forget is that God in times past has brought judgment upon the world. And he refers to the flood when they were mocking Noah who for 120 years was building an ark and they were just going, you know, Noah, you lost it, buddy. For 120 years, he built a boat and this boat was an enormous boat and everyone in the world was aware that there's some crazy guy on land building a boat and it's never rained. But for that 120 years, God was warning the world that one day, what he said would come to pass. And the reason that he hasn't come yet is because God is so patient, so long-suffering. He doesn't want anyone to perish. Matter of fact, if you go down to verse 9, we, we won't have time to cover that whole passage, but go down to, to verse 9, watch what he says. The Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but he is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He says, look, the Lord's, Lord's patient. He's, he's long-suffering. He's waiting. Why is he waiting so long? I don't know about you. There's sometimes I wake up and I go, Lord, you, you haven't come yet? What are you waiting for? He says, there, there's, there's some that still need to repent. There, there's still... A remnant. There's still a group that, that haven't yet turned from their sin. And so I'm waiting for them to do so. That's the patience of God. That's the long suffering of God. Now,
Throughout biblical history, God is warned before he brought his wrath. We saw the case of Noah, 120 years. You know, Noah was preaching righteousness for 120 years before the flood came. And, the, and he walks into the ark and the door closes behind him. You, you, you find that thing, that same, that same idea with Sodom and Gomorrah. Remember, remember when, when Abraham was pleading for Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels walk into Sodom and Gomorrah, the Lord himself walks in, and they, they were, you know, there to warn the whole city that God was going to bring judgment. And if you remember the story, they take the angels into Lot's house. And the men of the city start to bang on the door because they wanted to know them cardinally, the, the angels that is. And it, and it says that God put blindness on their eyes, but then he says this, that Noah was instructed, go tell your daughters and your son-in-laws to get out of the city. Because fire and brimstone is going to come upon the city. And Lot went and warned his family, and they, they were laughing at him because they thought he was joking. They didn't, they didn't take the warning seriously. And only Lot and his two daughters escaped. The city, but God warned them before. The wife left, but she, want, she wanted to go back and she turned into a pillar of salt, if you remember the story. But before God brought his judgment on Sodom and Gomorrah, he warned them. He, he, tr he tried to tell them, look, you know, it, it, it's time to awaken, it's time to, to repent, it's time to, to get right with God. Jonah was sent to Nineveh to warn them. That if they didn't repent, that God was going to send judgment upon the city of Nineveh. These, these, this was an unbelieving community. Present day Iraq. And Jonah walked into the city and he begins to preach, repent, or burn. Very effective message. Turn or burn. That's, that, was, that was the extent of his message. Because Jonah really didn't want them to repent because he didn't like them. They were, they were evil. And they repented. And God withheld his judgment from Nineveh. 150 years later, Nahum is sent back to Nineveh. And he gives the same warning. This time they don't repent and God judge, judges Nineveh. You see... God warns before he brings wrath. When Jesus had come upon the earth, there was a man by the name of John. He was referred to as John the Baptist. And he was out baptizing the Jordan River and people were flocking to him. And he had one message to, to the people. It was in Luke chapter 3, verse 7 is where we find that message. It says, and he said to the multitudes that came out to be baptized by him, brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come. He says, look, you guys are coming out to me, but how did you get the warning? Because God's wrath is going to come. And then he says, therefore, bear fruits worthy of repentance and do not begin to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I say to you that God is able to raise up children of Abraham from these stones. And, 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 and what, what John was saying is that, look, God's looking for a change. He's looking for a repentant heart. Bear the fruits that are worthy of repentance. In other words, let your actions prove your repentance, not just your lips. And don't revert back to the old thinking. Well, we're children of Abraham. We're not going to suffer. We're not going to experience God's wrath because we were born Jews. That, that was, that's the idea. He says, don't, don't, don't be fooled by that. That doesn't impress God. He, he's looking at the heart and he wants to see a changed life. That's God's heart. Now, If, 
It wouldn't be 40 years later that Jerusalem's destroyed by the Romans. Titus and his army came and encircled Jerusalem and in 70 AD destroyed the city and the temple. But it wasn't that they weren't warned before it happened. Right? Because that, that it's God's character. God doesn't want anyone to perish. He's trying to get their attention. He's, he's trying to awaken them before the wrath comes. It's always his heart. You find it uh, in, in, in the Old Testament often as God was trying to get the, the, the attention of the nation of Israel. And he would use natural situations in order to try to warn them. To try to get their attention. I, I, I'm just going to ask you to turn to one. Turn to Amos chapter 4 with me. I got a, a list of them, but we'll, we'll, we'll just focus on this one. Amos chapter 4, look at verse 6. God speaking to the nation of Israel. And watch what he declares. Also, I gave you cleanness of teeth in all of your cities. That doesn't mean he sent them to the dentist. It means they had no meat to eat. So they had clean teeth, okay? They didn't need to floss. That's what he was telling them. He had no need to floss. <laughs> and you had a lack of bread in all of your places, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I also withheld rain from you. When there were still three months to the harvest, I made it rain on one city. I withheld rain from another city. One part was rained upon, and where it did not rain, the part withered. So two or three cities wandered to another city to drink water, but they were not satisfied. Check this out. Yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. You see, God was allowing these natural things to happen to get the, the attention of his people. And he says, even though I allow those things to happen, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't wake up. You didn't, you didn't return to me. Let's look at the next verse. Verse 9. I blasted you with blight and mildew. When your gardens increased, your vineyards, your fig trees, your olive trees, the locusts devoured them, yet you did not return to me, says the Lord. He says, look, you, I, I, even when you had an abundance, I sent locusts to go devour it. It was so that you would realize that I'm the one who you need, not, not your, your things. He goes, and still you didn't return to me. Watch this. Look at, look at the next verse. Verse 10, I sent among you a plague after the manner of Egypt. Your young men I killed with a sword along with your captive horses. I made the stench of your camps come up into your nostrils, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. I overthrew some of you as God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, and you were like a firebrand plucked from the burning, yet you have not returned to me, says the Lord. Therefore, I will do to you, O Israel, because... I will do this to you, prepare to meet your God, O Israel. You see, God's saying, look, I, I, I gave every opportunity, I gave every warning to you. And you still didn't turn from your sin and turn to me. Get ready to meet your maker. That's what he's telling them. Get ready to meet your God. Over and over we find in the scriptures that God warns before he brings wrath. One of the things you find Jesus be, speak often about is his second coming. One of the longest sermons that he gave was the Olivet Discourse where he talks about the last days and the things that would happen prior to his return. And one of those things that he, that he describes, one of the things that, that he talks about is that there would be there would be famines. There would be wars. There would be earthquakes. Nation against nation, kingdom against kingdom. And one of the things he says is, is that those are the beginning of sorrows. And, and what, what it literally means is th 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 those are just like birth pangs. You see, those have been going on for, for thousands of years. There's been earthquakes for thousands of years. There's been pestilence for thousands of years. There's, there, there, there's been um, famine. 
But it seems that, that what, what Jesus is describing is that the intensity of it is going to grow stronger. The occurrence of it is going to be more often. And it's just going to it's just going to continue to build until it comes to a conclusion. And one of the things, you know, I've just been kind of looking at our world and it's going, man, we're starting to see on every front the warning signs. On every arena, there's, there's things happening. When it comes to famine, there, there's some serious talk that we're right around the corner from a shortage of food. And it's not just in one arena, it's, it's across the board. Our president just recently said that there, there, there's a chance that we're going to have a, a food shortage here shortly. And so I started looking into some of these things. In the last six weeks, there have been over 25 food distribution plants that have come under attack in the United States and in Canada. Guys, I, I don't know how you can mark that up as a coincidence or just a, an accident. There, there, there's some force that, that, that's, I think, trying to push us into a famine. I, I, there's an article. I, let, me, let me pull it up. It was a, an article from... The Western Standard, if you want to search that, you'll, you'll find it. Food shortages magnify by a string of destroyed food processing plants. And I'm just going to read you a couple of them. The Western Standard covered, um, let me see, food shortages have been exasperated by a string of fires, plane crashes, and explosions at nearly two dozen food processing facilities across Canada and the United States. The most recently happened, and it's, it says Thursday, which was just this last Thursday, in Georgia, when a small plane crashed shortly after takeoff into a General Mills plant just east of Atlanta. Two occupants of the plane were killed in the crash, according to the New York Post. A massive fire on Monday night destroyed parts of the Azure Standard headquarters in Oregon, a company that self-described as the USA's largest independent food distributor. Last Thursday, firefighters contended with a massive blaze at the Taylor Farms packaging salad plant in Salinas, California. The same day, an airplane crashed into Idaho's Gem State processing facility, a plant said to process over 18,000 acres worth of potatoes each year. On April the 13th, firefighters from several departments in Maine helped battle massive fires that destroyed East Conway beef and pork butcher shops and meat markets in Center Conway, New Hampshire. The Pennell Scott Potato Processing Facility in Belfast, Maine was also destroyed by fire in March. Officials believe a deep fryer was behind the fire. That, that's just a handful, guys. There's been over 24 in the last six weeks of these kinds of incidents happening in our nation. And that's not counting the cyber attacks that some of our meat processing plants are experiencing in the last two months. So, 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 something's awry. So we have some of those events taking place. An article in Newsweek on April the 30th, this, this is the article out of Newsweek, at least 11 U.S. states are experiencing historic levels of extreme doubt, drought, many of which are located in the West. According to the U.S. Drought Monitor, 
map published by the National Drought Mitigation Center at the University of Nebraska-Lincoln, the 11 states experiencing extreme drought conditions are New Mexico, Arizona, California, Nevada, Utah, Oregon, Washington, Montana, North Dakota, Colorado, and Wyoming, and some parts of Idaho and South Dakota. The NIDIS stated that from 1900 to 2014, scientists have identified 13 major drought episodes when at least 10% of the country is in drought. According to the NIDIS, most recent drought conditions updated, check this out, at least 39.8 of the US is in moderate drought, 29% is in severe drought, and 18.2% is in extreme drought. We're seeing, we're seeing the, the fires. I, I, I've never seen a fire that close to home the 30 years I've lived here. And we've seen two major fires just in our own backyard on the Bosques. That's happening in Colorado. Pray, pray for Las Vegas right now. They're on fire. Um, there, there's some families from our church that actually went up there to help because they have family there. But the, the fires that are taking place not only in, in uh, northern New Mexico, but in Colorado right now, have, have, we've seen more fire in the last year than I think we've seen in the last 20 years put together. There's a severe drought. I, I wonder if God's going, are you guys listening yet? Is anybody paying attention yet? You, you, you look at... I saw yesterday an article by the CEO of Goya Foods, Bob Yunanu, was interviewed yesterday. He said, the lockdowns, the supply chain strains, and now the conflict in Ukraine are all creating the perfect storm and will likely result in a collapse of the global food chain. We are in the precipice of a global food crisis. That's, that was... Yesterday, the CEO of Goya Foods said, we're, we're on the precipice of a global food crisis. What's going on in Ukraine, I, I think as, as he mentioned it in the, in the article, but one of the things in Ukraine is that's 30% of the wheat that, that feeds the region, all in Russia and Ukraine. And so we're, we're watching the perfect storm take place. When it comes to our society, it's something that, that struck me when, when Jesus in Matthew 24 starts to describe um, the days before he comes back. He says, it's going to be like the days of Noah. So the question is, well, what was going on in the days of Noah? In the days of Noah, his violence was, was just rampant in that culture. And sexual perversion was the other thing. Those were, those were kind of the two markers. It was, it was violence and sexual perversion was just off the charts before God destroyed the world with a flood. I was reading an article out of CNN. This was on 1026, which was just you know, five, six months ago. The United States just recorded the highest increase in rates of homicide in modern history, according to the U.S. Center of Disease Control and Prevention. Provision, provisional data from the CDC released earlier Wednesday suggests that homicide rate in the United States rose 30% between 2019 and 2020 the highest increase recorded in modern history and confirms through public health data a rise in homicide that so far has been identified only through crime statistics. In other words, they don't even have all the data, but what they do know is there's been at least a 30% increase in homicide just in the last year. Violence. Violence is sinning against your brother, your neighbor. Sexual perversion, sexual immorality is sinning against your own body. We talked a little bit last week about just what's going on with this, this whole um, 
educating our children in sexual activity from kindergarten all the way through college. You see, that, 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 that's what the Bible says is when, when you're involved in sexual immorality, you sin against yourself. It's the only sin that you sin against yourself. It's 1 Corinthians, if you're taking notes, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 18, watch this. Flee sexual immorality, for every sin that a man does is outside the body, but he who commits sexual immorality sins against his own body. So it's sinning against self, and then sinning against others. And that, that, was, that was the prevailing issue in the days of Noah. And you and I are living in the days of Noah. It's also interesting that um, California, if you guys have been, been watching the news, California, there's a bill AB 2223. It's about to pass into law. My, my daughter's living in California right now. They, their whole church, they took a, a group of people to the, to the, the, the White House, the, 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 the city, Council, wherever that is in, in, in San Francisco, I believe, or San Jose, to protest this law. This is the law. It will allow people to murder their children up to 28 days after it is born. Not, not in the womb. 28 days after the baby is born, you can kill it and consider it an abortion. That, that, that's, that's, that's what we're dealing with today. As we're, we're living in the days of Noah. When it comes to the spiritual, you know, temperature, we're, we're seeing apostasy. Not, not, just, not just people walking away from the church, but infiltrating the church into some very, very dark doctrine. I, 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 I was given a clip um, of a Presbyterian church. And in the Presbyterian church, there, there's, there's another one. I think, I think the other one I was th uh, that I, I found was in Sweden, where they literally took down all of the crosses in their church because they wanted to build a Muslim prayer room, and they didn't want to offend Muslims. So they took down the crosses in their own church so that they can build a Muslim prayer room in their church. But this was in the United States. The, the clip's up on the screen for you. Oh, God of pronouns. We give praise to the Great One, the one who is identifiable as God. I am what I am, you say, the great they. The incarnate he and she, the God of trans being. Impregnating Mary, fathering God, breastfeeding God of many breasts, you, shadow, you shatter all stereotypes making every single person male and female. Male and female, intersex, non-binary, in your image. Exactly in your image. That's enough, cut that. Spec I, I don't know about you, but that just turns my stomach. And that's happening in mainstream church, right in our backyard. Guys, I, I, I share this stuff with you because I, I think you and I are on the, on, the, on the verge, we're in the end, we're at the cliff. And we, you and I need to be aware of the days that we're living in. We, 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 we can't be blind, we can't, we can't be walking around going, you know, everything's like it always was. There, there's something stirring. And, and you and I need to be, be aware of it. Daniel in chapter 12, verse 4, he says that in the latter days, knowledge will increase. Guys, we're living in, in the most knowledgeable culture that has ever existed. Knowledge at your fingertips. You, you, can, you can find out any answer you're looking for with just a, a few clicks of a button. 
knowledge abounding. There's a few passages in Scripture that, that you know, you, you, you read, and I, I got saved 30 years ago. When I, when I first got saved, you, you kind of read some of these passages, and you're kind of like, man, how's that going to happen? How, how will that ever come to be? That, that it don't even make sense. I mean, you know, what, 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 is, what is the Scripture saying? Here, 30 years later, I go, you know, you read it, and you go, I see how that can happen right now. One of those in the book of Revelation chapter 11 and verse 8. Watch, check this out. Revelation 11, 8. It's speaking of the two witnesses that are going to speak truth in the middle of the Antichrist reigning. And watch what it says about them. Their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which is spiritually called Sodom in Egypt where also our Lord was crucified. So we know where it is, it's Jerusalem, right? That's where Jesus was crucified. Then those from the peoples, tribes, tongues, and nations will see their dead bodies three and a half days and not allow their dead bodies to be put into graves. Matter of fact, this is they're throwing a party. It's going to be a celebration. They finally got rid of these two witnesses and they're, 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 they're ecstatic that they finally died. But here's the part that it never that it always struck me. It's like every tribe, people, tongue, and nation is gonna see that. That's global. What he's describing isn't isn't a local event. This is a global event. How in the world is everyone from every nation, every people, and every tribe gonna see these guys sitting in the streets for three and a half years? CNN, cable networks, it's going to be live on YouTube, it's going to be on every Instagram and every Facebook page that you, you, would, you would ever desire to look at, it's going to be front and center so that everyone's going to see these three guys lying in the street. Guys, 30, 40 years ago, you would, you, that, that wouldn't even make sense. Today, it's just like, duh. Very, very, very easy to put together. Look, look, look at Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse 15. This, is, this one's in interesting. He was granted power to give breath to the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause as many as would not worship the image of the beast to be killed. Now he's talking about the Antichrist is going to be put into the temple that, that's, that's erected for the Jews to worship, and the devil, Satan, or the Antichrist, empowered by Satan, he's going to be in the temple, and he's going to say, you used to worship God, but now you worship me. And there's going to be an image there, and if you don't worship this image, then you're going to be killed. And the question was, how does this image have life? Guys, we are beyond the technology for that to happen in, in our culture right now. AI could easily be manufactured to, to replicate this antichrist. They, they, they have, they have uh, holograms that they can actually put there. But I, I, I'm, you know, it, it's interesting. If, if you look at what's going on, they are attempting within the next five to 10 years that we're no longer going to need a labor force. They've already begun with, with, you know, hamburgers and fast food joints. It's all done mechanically, machine. And they believe that it's not going to be long before that is the norm in every manufacturing job. And, uh, you know, you don't even have to go to, to, the, uh, to talk to a person. You just be able to order and do everything you need off of, off of a screen. It's all, it's all happening. You've seen it at McDonald's already, right? I mean, th this, is, this is something that's, that's pushing forward. It's interesting that when, it, when it was listening to a, a conversation with, with Musk, uh, Elon Musk, and, and he was saying that we're going to have to, the, the only way that the society is going to survive is we're going to have to give paychecks to everybody that's alive because there's not going to be enough work for everyone to have. So we're, we're, we're heading there very rapidly. 
But what's, what's interesting in, in this passage is that this AI, I, I, you see, when I was a kid, before, make, before Disneyland went crazy, before Disneyland went woke, <laughs> Um, when I was a kid, I remember going to Disneyland, and I was impressed. So, you know, as a little boy, you know, 9, 10, 11 years old, they would have Abraham Lincoln. You get, you guys been to Disneyland, you see the Abraham Lincoln, and he stands up, and he, he dresses the crowd, and, you know, and as a kid, you're just like, man, I mean, they replicated, and just his mouth would move, and it, you know, and you just kind of like, man, that's pretty impressive. As that, that, was, that was technology from 40 years ago. The technology today, they can make something that would, you, you couldn't tell the difference between living and robot. It's all here. It's not something that's going to happen. It's something that's already happening. And so for them to put the Antichrist and do, do all of this, it, it, wouldn't even, it wouldn't even be a deal. But look at the next verse. This is, this, is, this is what's interesting. Verse 16. He causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and slave, to receive a mark on their right hand or on their foreheads, and that no one may buy or sell except one who has the mark of the name of the beast and the number of his name. And we know that 666, right? Now, I, 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 there's, I would encourage if you're interested in that, go, just go Google cashless um, society and, 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 and you know, computer chip cashless society and you'll, you'll get hundreds of videos. It's, it's, it's being promoted very um, heavily right now and it's normal. Every, every time I hear people talking about it, I'm like, yeah, it, it's inevitable. We have to go there. We have to go there. It's, it's the next thing that's going to happen. But, but what, what's interesting is that technology is already being used. Sweden, it's becoming mainstream to put a chip in your hand. It, it's able to operate all of your, just like the little chip inside of your credit card, they're, they're able to, to, to do all of your transactions through just scanning your hand, just like the, you know, like, uh, the pay that you just swipe your card on. That same technology is available where you can just swipe your hand across it. It's already, it's already being used. I was talking to a restaurant owner that after first service, he says over 75% of all transactions in our restaurant are cashless. That we're not even, we're, we've just kind of adapted to it. It's just become the norm. But the, 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 what, what's wild is that in Sweden, at workplaces, at you know, a, a, different arenas, you can start your car with your chip, you, you, you don't have to take keys with you, you, can, you don't have to take a wallet, you, all, all of your financial information's already in your chip, all your medical information's in your chip, it's going to have everything you need so that every transaction, everything you do is recorded, everywhere you go, everything you participate in. I found this, this one clip, and, and like I said, there was a host of them, but this one really intrigued me. Look, look it's from the, the World um, Economic Forum. Check this out. What underpins a world order is always the financial system. Hmm. I, I was very privileged. My father was an advisor to Nixon when they came off the gold standard in 71, and so I was brought up with a kind of inside view of how very important the financial structure is to absolutely everything else. And what we're seeing in the world today, I think, is we are on the brink of a dramatic change where we are about to, and I'll say this boldly, we're about to abandon the traditional system of money and accounting and introduce a new one. And the new one, the new accounting, is what we call blockchain. It means digital. It means having an almost perfect record of every single transaction that happens in the economy, which will give us far greater clarity over what's going on. It also raises huge dangers in terms of the balance of power between states and citizens. In my opinion, we're going to need a digital constitution of human rights if we're going to have digital money. Uh, but also, this new money will be sovereign in nature. Most people think that digital money is crypto and private. But what I see are superpowers introducing digital currency. The Chinese were the first. 
The U.S. is on the brink, I think, of moving in the same direction. The Europeans have committed to that as well. And the question is, will that new system of digital money and digital accounting accommodate the competing needs of the citizens of all these locations so that every human being has a chance to have a better life? Because that's the only measure of whether our world order really serves. That was a conference that took place like a month ago. Guys, all of the world powers are already moving in that direction. And their desire is to set up a one world government and a one world monetary system. And alongside of that will be a one world religion. And it's all lines up with scripture. See, we're, 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 you and I are living in amazing times. When it comes to the political world, um, everything revolves around the nation of Israel. The United States, if it's mentioned, it's vaguely mentioned, but everything revolves around the nation of Israel. Israel became a nation in 1948. That, that, was, that wasn't um, that long ago, right? So we're, we're, this, this is the generation, the very end of that generation that, that saw that happen. What's interesting is, is it wasn't until 1967 that Jerusalem was ruled by Israel solely before it was split in two. And many believe that the, the, the beginning where Jesus says, not a generation will pass until all these things come to pass, they, they, they mark it at the, the date that Israel took over Jerusalem because that was God's holy city. And so they, they mark the, the beginning of this, the, the generation in 1967 rather than 1948, which would give it another, add another 19 years to a generation that, that many have tried to use as the marker. And it's, it's just interesting that we're at, in that time frame right now. So all of that to say that Israel is the marker Israel had to become a nation again before Jesus would, would, would come back a second time. They, they had to be in play because in like Zechariah chapter 12, verse 2 and 3, it says that Israel will be a heavy stone that oh, everyone's going to want to push away. But it's going to be the stone that crushes all of them because God's with them, right? So there, there's, there, there's, there's that implication. It talks about the nations of the north coming up against Israel. That would be Russia and that conglomeration of, of, of nations, what's referred to as Rosh in, in Ezekiel chapter 38. They're going to come and try to destroy Israel. It's interesting how Israel right now is kind of flexing their muscle. And uh, Iran and China, China also, in the book of Revelations chapter 9, there's going to be an army of over 200 million people that come against the nation of Israel. The only one that can man that army is China. And so it's believed that they're going to join forces with Russia. Think about what's happened as of COVID and with what's going on in Ukraine. China and Russia are now on terms of um, collaborating together for the first time. You, you and I are living in exciting times. And, 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 I, and I share this with you because, man, I, I think you and I need to be aware of where we're at and what's going on. Not to scare you. Trust me, that, that's not my heart this morning. My, 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 is that, that we would be like, you know, awake. Right, before I move on, let, let be, and, and I, want, I want to wrap this up here, but there, there was um, just announced a couple days ago, you guys heard of Elon Musk bought Twitter um, three days after because he's going to open up to um, not censoring any opposing views. The Biden administration announced that there's a new branch of Homeland Security and it's called the Disinformation Governance Board. That happened three days after Musk just said he was going to open up Twitter. In other words, they're going to try to control what you hear and what I hear. They're going to, because if it doesn't fit the narrative, then they're going to try to silence it like they've been this last two years. When it comes to COVID, when it comes to um, what's going on in Russia, when, what, what, you know, the, the Ukraine, 
they, they, they've just snuffed it. The things going on with Hunter Biden and, and, the, and his laptop, there's some very incriminating stuff on there, and they've been hiding it and hiding it and hiding it because they, they've been able to. And if someone were to open it up, all that stuff would be exposed. And so they got a new, a new board, a governance board, that will stop all disinformation. Now, who, 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 who calls it disinformation? <laughs> That's the question. Right, that that guys, if you if you're George Orwell's book, 1984, you guys you guys ever watch that or hear that or he almost to the T describes what you and I are living through right now. It's 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 eerie. Um, in in the book it was in in if you I think it was a movie too, but in the book it was um, the Ministry of Truth <laughs> that they described that would stop anyone who who had con contradicting narratives or against what they would declare to be true. Times, the times you're living in. Now, be, be, I, I don't want to leave you there. I, I want you to turn with me to 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. All of that, just to kind of prepare you <laughs> for what 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 says. Check this out. Verse 1, but concerning the times and the seasons, brethren, you have no need that I should write to you. But you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Does that verbiage sound familiar? It's the same thing Jesus was saying in Matthew chapter 24. Everyone's going to think everything's just fine. The days of Noah, everything's just fine. He says, but it's going to be like labor pains upon a pregnant woman. And then God's wrath is going to come. And then verse 4, here it is. But you, brethren, who's he talking to? The believers, us. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that that day should overtake you as a thief. You're the sons of the light. You're sons of the day. You're not of the night nor of darkness. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us, check it out, watch and be sober. Check that out. Because this isn't going to come upon you by surprise. He's talking to the unbeliever. That's the one the thief's going to come upon. The believers living in the day. They're living, they're living in the light. We're the ones that, that are to be sober. We're the ones that, 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 that are to be aware of what's going on. Look, look, look at the next verse. Look at, look at verse 6. Therefore, let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. For those who sleep, sleep at night. Those who get drunk, they're drunk at night. But let us who are of the day be sober. Check it out. Putting on the breastplate of faith. And of love, and as a helmet, the hope of salvation. Guys, Ephesians chapter 5, the, the, the whole armor of God that we just went through, he gives us another, another, another reference here. Put on the breastplate of faith. You have the shield of faith, and the Helmet of hope and salvation. And then, here it is. His grand finale, verse 9. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or we sleep, we should live together with him. Therefore, comfort each other and edify one another, just as you're also doing. God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation. We talked about it earlier. Those last seven years, it's the wrath of God. I'm a firm believer that the church isn't going to be here for the wrath of God. We're going to be taken, and we're going to be seated at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And we're going to be having a seven-year party while seven years of wrath gets poured out upon this world. 
You see, things leading up to it are going to get crazy. And I think that's the days you and I are living in. But I believe Jesus is coming back for his church, for his bride. And he's going to take us with him. And we're going to be with him in heaven forever and ever and ever. And there's going to be no more pain, no more sorrow, no more suffering, no more death. No, no, none of this exists. We're, everything you and I know is going to be perfected. We're going to be in his presence. And his encouragement was like, you know, guys, stand strong. There, you're, there's a war going on. You don't need a breastplate if you're, if you're sitting at the beach in the Bahamas, do you? You need a breastplate because there's incoming. <laughs> You don't need a shield if, if everything's, you know, just fine and dandy. You need a shield because there, there, there's being, there, darts are being launched at you. He says, take, take, take your shield, put on your breastplate. And go out and, 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 and be light. Make a difference. Know what's going on. And, and, and we need to know what's going on, but it should cause us to... Be comforted, to be encouraged, knowing, you know what, this, this is all coming to a head, but I know who I put my faith in. I know who my confidence is in. Let me close with one more verse, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll ask you to turn to Romans chapter 13. Same type of verbiage, and I, I think it's interesting how he, he did this. Look at Romans 13, look at verse 12. Romans 13, 12. The night is almost gone, and the day is at hand. Let us therefore lay aside the deeds of darkness and put on the armor of light. Let us behave properly as in the day, not in carousing and in drunken, drunkenness, check it out, nor in sexual promiscuity and sensuality, not in strife and in jealousy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh in regard to its lusts. What's, 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 what's he encouraging us to do? Live holy. To be set apart for the Lord. To be living in, 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 in obedience. To, to be those who are, who are seeking his face and desiring his will and, and you know, growing in, in, our, in our faith. That's his desire for us. And because I, I believe God put us in this time for, for the moment that we're in. That's not accident. He knew that you would be alive in this time period. And that you would use that gift that God's given you. That, that ability God's given you. The resources God has given you for his kingdom and for his glory. Because the days are just ticking. And our Jesus is coming back. Man, may we be ready. He kept telling us, watch, watch, be ready. Watch. And we're watching now, and you're going, all right, Lord. It's getting good. It's getting exciting. And I want to be faithful to the end. Amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time, for your word, for the truths that it declares. God, that, God you, you, always, you always warn God, there's, there's so many lights flashing and sirens going off. It's, it's, it's unbelievable. God, we, we just thank you that, God, we are of the light. We're not like those that are living in darkness that can't see what's really going on. And Lord, I pray this morning, God, maybe for some of us, God, it's, it's the wake-up call. Just like you did to the children of Israel. You said, I, I brought this and I brought this and I brought this and you still didn't repent. And Lord, it might be to, this morning, God, you're... you're once again, shaking us, saying it's, it's time. It's time to repent. It's time to get right. It's time to forsake the works of darkness. It's time to surrender your heart, your mind. So, Lord, I just pray that your Holy Spirit fall upon us. Lord, I pray that you, God, would awaken us 
so that we truly, God, would, would see the times we're living in and how soon it is, God. May it stir us to good works. May, may it remind us, God, of things that are eternal. Just before we close and before we conclude, maybe this morning you're, you're here, you're maybe visiting, maybe for the very first time, man, God has opened your ears, your eyes, your heart. And it's time to, to just say, God, I, I, I surrender, I give, I, I repent. I want to I invite you to come and be the Lord of my life. Maybe, maybe that might be what's going on in your heart this morning. Maybe for some of us, we've been kind of, kind of playing the fence. We've been lukewarm. We're just kind of straddling between the world and wanting you know, to know about God. But we, we really haven't decided, man, I, I, I'm going I'm to surrender my heart to Jesus, man. I, I'm not going to play games any longer. And today, God's speaking to your heart. He's trying to wake you up so that you're not slumbering. You're not sleepwalking. This morning, man, before we partake of communion, you see, communion is for those who have made a decision to follow Christ. And before we partake of communion, man, if you have yet to do so, or you know, man, I, 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 need, to, I need to repent right now. I need to ask Jesus to forgive me. I want to do this morning is give you an opportunity before we partake of communion to make that decision. So just really, really quick, before we ask the communion team to come forward, God is speaking to your heart. I invite you this morning to take that step by faith and say, Jesus, I'm a sinner. I need a savior. Forgive me. You died for me, and I want to now ask you to come and live inside of me. And if that's you this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. It's, it's a step of faith. It's, it's that action of, okay, God, I heard you now. I, I need to respond to what you just said. I'm going to ask, because it's communion, I'd normally ask you to come forward or to stand up. I'm just going to ask you, just, just for sake of time, if God is speaking to your heart, would, would you acknowledge that God's speaking to you and make that decision to follow him this morning by raising your hand and say, Pastor Ray, I want to pray right now. And I want to ask Jesus to be the Lord of my life. God bless you. God bless you guys back there. Amen. 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 Anybody else, man, before we close? On the foyer? You're in the sanctuary, man. You see, God got you back there, darling. Awesome. Awesome. You see, I, I, I don't think there's coincidence. I don't believe in coincidence. I, I believe God has divine appointments for us. I don't think you're here by accident. I think God brought you here because he's trying to get your attention because he loves you. But God is a gentleman. He'll never force you. He's not going to get you in an arm bar and make you say, uncle. That's not how he operates. You see, God says, I, I, I'm calling you. You can come or you can reject. But what you choose will have eternal impact. So just before we ask the team to come forward, if there's anyone else, we're going to pray for those of you that have made that decision this morning. But if there's anybody else and you're saying, hey, me too. Got you, brother. Got you. God bless you. God bless you. Anybody else, man? I just want, I don't want to leave you out. God, speak into your heart. Take that step back there. God bless you. Awesome. Well, that's so cool. We're, we're going to pray. And, and I, I'm going to lead you in this prayer, but this is your prayer. You, you have to make it your prayer. You talk to God. Tell him that you need him. And that you're ready to surrender your heart and your life to him. So would you pray this prayer with me as we go before the Lord together? Dear God, I confess to you, I'm a sinner. I thank you for sending your son Jesus. That he died for me. That he rose from the grave. And he defeated death and sin. God, would you forgive me, cleanse me, and would you fill me with your Holy Spirit right now? I'm yours, God. And I ask these things 
In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you guys. God bless you.